Up to the 90s, Glenfiddich employees got into the habit of pouring a teaspoon of whiskey into their sister company's Belvini barrels of whiskey. Those barrels were spoiled forever because they could no longer be called single malts. Single malt scotch comes from one distillery. That's where the single comes from, and the malt means it's 100% malted barley, not a blend of different grains. So for something to be a single malt scotch, it needs to come from one distillery and have malted barley as the only grain source in making that whiskey. Now, when Glenfiddich employees poured that teaspoon of whiskey into a bottle of Balvenie, they destroyed it because now it could no longer be a single malt barrel. It, that barrel was now a blend did malt, a blend, a blend of multiple distilleries, at least two, and a malt, 100% malted barley. Glenfiddich isn't the only company that was doing this. In fact, one of the better whiskeys I've ever had was a very old 30 plus year old Macallan that had some Highland Park in it. Again, not a single malt anymore. The 30 year old Macallan is worth tens of thousands of dollars and the bottle that I had was only, only cost about $200 because it was no longer a single malt. These affectionately became known as teaspoon whiskeys. And the reason, of course, was because this teaspoon of another distiller was poured into it. But why would anybody do this? I mean, nobody's doing it to save me money. The truth is, distilleries have this long tradition of taking barrels of whiskey and moving them between different companies. Single malt distilleries in Scotland make blended whiskeys. And by blended, I mean blended of corn malted barley. So you think of your Johnny Walker. In the case of Balvini and Glenfiddich, it's Grant's company, so Grant's Family Reserve is a blended scotch. And these are blends of different distilleries and also of different grain types. And so while you know we know Balvini, Glenfiddich, McAllen, Highland Park, we know these great distilleries. As single malt distilleries, most of the product many of these distilleries make goes into blended malts. And so there are barrels. There are tons of barrels that distilleries have. Sometimes they produce too many, and so they sell some off to other competitors. Sometimes they don't produce enough and they need to buy from competitors. And there's also a third layer to this is independent bottlers. They buy barrels from other distilleries and bottle them themselves. So, uh, you know, they might be Highland Parks, they might be Laphroaigs, they might be Lagavulins, but when they bottle them, they bottle them under their own name. The reason why they did this is barrel just may not have fit the profile they needed. Barrels are individual little atmospheric chambers that age the whiskey. And sometimes the barrel just doesn't meet the profile that the distillery needs. And so they ship it off in batches to, to other distilleries or other producers. So going back to teaspoon whiskey, it's not a gossipy whiskey, though it does enlist a bunch of gossip. When you get one of these teaspoon whiskeys, you're like, where did the liquid come from? Companies like Belvini and Glenfiddich didn't want an independent baller to get a barrel and then put Belvini on the label. And they could. Under the Scotch Whiskey Association, if it has Belvini on it, you can legally put Belvini on the bottle. And of course, nobody wants that. If you're Belvini, you don't want somebody else bottling the Belvini. Today, especially, we have lawyers and lawyers enforce contracts that when they sell these barrels, they say you can't put Belvini on the bottle. So you buy the barrel and then part of the contract is saying you are limited to what you can put on the label. But in the old days, things were much simpler. By taking a teaspoon of Glenfiddich and putting it into a Balvini, that no longer became a single malt scotch. That's no longer a barrel that comes single sourced from Balvini distillery. And therefore the independent bottler could no longer say it was the Balvini on the bottle. Crude, but effective. And now there are a bunch of independent bottlers that do buy these barrels and they sell them to you. They're not many and they're, they're so few and far between, uh, but you can find them. And generally, generally they're a good price. Now look, from a price perspective, it's always kind of weird because especially if you're buying a single barrel of a distillery or some, a small blend, you're gonna get a different profile than what you're expecting. I, I used the example of a 30 year old Macallan, the one that I had that had some Highland Park in it. It was really good, but it did not go under the same, you know, blending process that a Macallan 30 does. The Macallan 30, they have a bunch of barrels to choose from. They, they taste, they blend, they put together and they produce a product that is that, that they feel fits that consumer base that can spend $30,000 on a bottle. When you go to an independent bottler, they have fewer options. So personally, I find the whiskeys a little more, what I would say, true to the distillery because the, none of the, none of the, uh, characteristics have been blended out, but also imperfect. And there's nothing wrong with imperfect whiskey. In fact, I'd say a lot of my favorite whiskeys have been imperfect because flaws are wonderful, especially when you taste a lot of whiskey. If you're tasting the same old, same old thing, your, your palate gets used to it, but these little flaws in, across your palate become interesting, become you know something that's fascinating. And that's true with anything. It's true with cocktails or food. Everything evolves. And right now, a lot of these 
whiskeys that are produced that are interesting are very great for the palate. So yeah, I'll post a link uh, to a few of these independent bottlers that do teaspoon whiskey. They're very rare, but I think they are worth chasing if you like a bit of an adventure and a little bit of gossip with your whiskey. Cheers.